The Notebook on Cities and Culture mailing list fires off regular updates about the show, and you, my friends, can subscribe. Visit kotlinmarshall.org and click Mailing List in the upper right column for details. Season 3 of Notebook on Cities and Culture is brought to you by Carl Haley and Daniel Murphy. sit on top of a mountain that Japanese know, as you've told me, from a card game, a beloved card game. They play on New Year's. Well, what is this game? The game is called Karuta. It's a hundred card set, mm. which they play on a tatami mat floor. And the idea is that when part of a famous poem is read, you try and dive and collect the second half, which is on another card on the floor. Mm. It's a game of speed, but also of memory. You have to memorize all of these hundred poems. The collection was actually compiled by Fujiwara Taker, who was a famous poet in the 12th century, and uh, he lived at the foot of, of Mount Ogura. He had a villa here, and he was commissioned by a friend to compile a collection of the best, the creme de la creme of Japanese poetry. Mm. So the mountain has for long been associated with poetry, and that's been transferred into a sort of card game, a competitive game that's played at New Year. Mm. It is Notebook on Cities and Culture. I'm Colin Marshall, sitting above a city, actually, sitting above Greater Kyoto, Japan, sitting on Mount Ogura with Stephen Gill, who is a poet, translator, teacher, creator of radio programs for the BBC on subject, subjects Japanese and, and otherwise. And he is a preservationist of this mountain. His group is in, in English, people together for Mount Ogura. In, in Japanese, it's what? Ogureyama Hyakunin Ishu no Kai. Mm. Uh, Ogureyama Hyakunin Ishu is actually the name of the collection mm. uh, compiled by Teika. And we changed one character. Instead of it being 100 poems, uh, it's actually working together for, but it has the same sound in Japanese. So it's people uh, on Mount Ogura, not writing poems, but working together for Mount Ogura. Hmm. PTO is its abbreviation. I want to give listeners a sense of, of why people are working together for, for Mount Ogura, but I, I should cite the, the famous headline. I'll try to remember what it was in Japanese. Ogurayama Gominoyama. Was that it? What, what's, what's the story behind that? Well, this was about uh, 10 years ago on national television, a breakfast show. Somebody came to Mount Ogura and uh, they knew that there was this strange British poet collecting <laughs> rubbish here. And the camera crew came out. I showed them the rubbish and the fact that I was trying to do something about it. And as a headline, they used that, those words. Uh, Mount Ogura, which is famous for poets and Japanese literature, now a mountain of trash. Mm. And it rather shocked the nation. Uh, the pundits at the breakfast show discussed the problem and all agreed, very unusually, on this particular issue, that something should be done about it. But why on earth was it a, a British guy who happened to be living at the foot of the mountain who was doing something? Well, I'm glad to say that lots has happened since that program was broadcast, and we have cleared, uh, with the notable help of an, an MPO, of whom I'm now a member, who got involved after the program, uh, about 30 tons of, of the rubbish. There's probably 10 tons left. Mm. Uh, so we're doing it slowly but surely and relentlessly, and the mountain is getting cleared up. A listener is now thinking to themselves, why, why is this mountain? Isn't it a beloved mountain? It's a, this card game. Japanese know the mountain from the card game. They, they play it every year they, they, they delightfully with their families. Why, why are they covering the mountain in trash? This is something to do with the Japanese um, mentality. Uh, there's a certain type of Japanese who will, if you like, uh, look for an opportunity to get something for free mm. or will look for an opportunity to get rid of something when nobody's looking. And there are a number of people in this city and elsewhere in Japan who spy out a place where nobody goes mm. and just drop all their trash there. It's not a unique problem to Mount Ogura. However, Mount Ogura is sort of paramount in the literary history of Japan as a mountain which poets have flocked to, that it's been immortalized in verse for 1,200 years. And it seems to me that it's a very unfortunate mountain because it's now in the shadow of 
Mount Arashiyama, mm. which is a brocade of autumn colors in the autumn and a brocade of new leaves and spring blossom in the spring. And I think everybody goes to see Mount Arashiyama and rather forgets its neighbor, famous though it is in literature. Mm. And in, the neighbor has a rather beguiling little slope on its backside where nobody goes, and it's very easy to tip trash off that cliff at the backside of the mountain. Mm. Now, I've not personally seen the trash, but I have seen the changing colors, and it is a sight I've savored. Listeners, if only, if only you could see it. I guess a, a big wish you were here to, uh, to, to the listeners. But the fact, the fact of, the, of the trash, I mean, I want to know how you discovered the mountain was so, it had become so trashed. But I want to know first how you personally discovered this mountain. How did it become uh, yours in, in, in the sense that it is a mountain you love? Okay, well, I'm a poet, so I have a personal domain and a personal world, and certainly this is a part of my domain, and uh, I'm very attached to it, simply because when I first came to Kyoto in the 1970s, I happened to be living at Arashiyama. Mm. So I knew this area just to the north, uh, adjacent to Arashiyama, and Saga is its name, and the main mountain above Saga, in other words, the main countryside to walk in, is Mount Ogura. So inevitably, when I moved here in 95, this is my third time in Japan, been here ever since, um, I started to discover the beauties and also the sadness of this hill. Uh, it was very apparent immediately when I started hiking up here that this had been a long, uh, unloved mountain. Mm. People no longer came in and maintained the forest and took the dead timber out down to the city to burn in their uh, baths, to heat the bath water or to burn in their ovens and stoves to do the cooking on and uh, the numbers of people working in the forest were very very reduced so all sorts of things were happening and nobody was really reporting them mm. uh, for example there's been a terrible disease and there's been a terrible death a dieback of all the pine trees they're a feature of the landscape of Kyoto nobody was really doing anything about it on this mountain until 15 years ago mm. I discovered all sorts of things However, it's not been an individual crusade. It's just that being a poet, I can write about it. So I did, uh, for example, a book of poetry, uh, which I wrote in one day, 100 po poems that this mountain gave me, uh, 100 poems uh, in the day. And uh, in doing that, I showed people that the mountain was not only a wonderful place to walk, but it was also a sad place and something should be done about it. I also did an exhibition. I'm a... Uh, something of a stone arranging artist it's a hobby I have mm -hmm. and I'm occasionally called in to do some little sort of installation uh, when I did an installation on the theme of Mount Ogura I arranged my stones with bits of found rubbish all brought from the mountain mm -hmm. and uh, that also alerted one or two members of the media to the fact that there was a problem here mm -hmm. so I've used my uh, role as a poet and an artist as somebody who expresses feelings to do something for this mountain. But it's by no means a solitary campaign. I'm surrounded now by lots of friends, uh, mainly Japanese, who feel the same way, and uh, one or two of them have been campaigning for the mountain longer than I have. I only met them more recently. I didn't realize there was a problem at the summit about the reforestation after tunnel digging, for example. Mm. Another problem. Mount Ogre has been long underloved and uh, abused, basically, and uh, things are changing fast. It is, it is seemingly a distinctively victimized mountain, is it not? Yeah, it's almost cruel what's happened to Mount Ogura. <laughs> I don't know what it is about it. It's, it's perhaps it's, its very accessibility makes it vulnerable. Mm. It also is uh, isolated from the other hills. It's got a gorge, a ravine running down two sides. Mm. And on the uh, third and fourth side, it's got rather somber, dark forest. And perhaps many people don't want to venture in there. Uh, it's a beguiling mountain to me, though. It's full of mysteries. Uh, but perhaps that side of uh, its inaccessibility on its far side, uh, contrasting with its accessibility on its near side, has led to a lot of problems on the dark side of Mount Ogura. Mm. Now tell us about one more collection of poetry that is available that, that, uh, that, that your group, the, those who are now caring for Mount Ogura, put together their, their poems, their hundred poems that were... That, that has raised funds successfully. What, what is this book? Okay, well, this book is modelled on Fujiwara Taker's uh, 100 poems, one poem each collection. Mm. So it's entitled Ogura Hyakunin 
ogure yama hyakunin ishu. So instead of ogure hyakunin ishu, we put a yama in. So this time it's 100 poems by 100 poets mm. on Mount Ogura. Mm. So these are all people who've come to the mountain, who've walked here, who've seen the problems and have largely done something to help. In other words, it's a book of poems by volunteers. Now, some of them are pretty good poets themselves, because I have a poetry group. Some of them are almost, you could say, professional poets. But many of them are just students who came here for one uh, half day of voluntary labor, and I put pencil and paper in their hand, and they actually managed to come up with something publishable. Mm. Uh, there are all sorts of people in the book, uh, 100 poets, and it represents the mountain and its many faces, sad, happy, in all the different seasons, alluding to the history and the literature, but also thinking about the future. Uh, it's a real bonanza of a collection of uh, this side of Kyoto today. Mm. Now, I'm certainly, I'm certainly going to ask for a few poems of, of yours toward the end of the program, but I don't know, would you like to, would you like to read any of the ones the, that the, the volunteers have, uh, have written, or is it, I don't know what your personal rule about that is, if you, if you want to read the poem another has written, or if... Uh... Colin, you are in charge, I will do whatever you oh, like. Okay, so, excellent. do you want to give me a bit of time to select one, or...? Sure. <laughs> Falling red leaves colour the face of Mount Ogura. With these, it tries to hide the rubbish lying there. Through mountain woods, reaching at last a roadway, dry and hard. Here, fly tipping has become the norm. Nobody knows where the owner is, this bicycle thrown in a bamboo grove. The spring breeze, it comes from over your shoulder, Mount Ogura. Bending with the river, red October dusk, the maple hills melt into night. Remains of the party the crickets had last night. Wild chrysanthemums bloom. To the nation's mount of poetry, a foreigner guides me there. Mm. <laughs> Collecting rubbish. Wearing fluffy hats, people on Mount Ogura. We've, we've seen a few fluffy hats pass by us before we started recording, have we not? It's a popular day, well, a popular it's, it's day. It's a hiking mountain, you right. know. Uh, as I said, 15 years ago when I moved into this area, uh, I was one of the only walkers uh, on this mountain. Mm. I think the paths were less well-maintained, um, there is now something of a fashion for hitting the mountain trails, mm. and the shops down in Kyoto and in other towns in Japan now sell a nice smart array of fancy-coloured mountain gear. So this is somewhere where people do, do walk nowadays. We have certainly passed some hikers. Mm. When I came in at the Saga Arashiyama station, I, I was... It was on this wave of people, all of whom seemed to be heading, heading right here. I mean, this is, this is, this is the season, is, is it not? Yeah, they're mainly heading to Arashiyama, the neighboring mountain, right. because you can see that safely across the w river water, reflecting the river water, um, this beautiful brocade of autumn colors. Mm. Uh, very few of them will actually come up here. Mm. But the hiker type of person will certainly, you know, once in a while come up onto Mount Ogura, and this is a very good thing. Mm. Uh, there are those who have been uh, living here locally who would like to keep Mount Ogura almost off limits. Uh, but I think our group really would like to make the mountain available to people coming up from Osaka for a day of hiking or to the local people who live below, like they used to use the mountain, to come up in and to be in nature and enjoy the seasons from a little bit of a distance. As I mentioned at the beginning, we're, we're looking down on greater Kyoto, you might say, and the integration of, of city and nature here is... I don't know if it's, it's something still notable to a Japanese, but certainly to me, an American, 
It is, and to an Englishman as well, no doubt. Yeah, I think it's one of the wonderful things about Kyoto. Uh, the fact that the city is surrounded on three sides by these hills, and on all, all of those three sides you can get into the hills fairly easily. Uh, on this particular side of town, the west side of town, we have the most beautiful hills, and we have the deepest hills, I think, and uh, perhaps they're easiest to get into. But because they're a little bit removed from the centre, uh, this is a little bit further away from the heart of the centre than the eastern hills are or the northern hills are, uh, it does have its problems, as we've already mentioned. But Kyoto, uh, with its seasonal changes, it's not something to only experience in Japanese gardens, in temple gardens and things. It's something that everybody really should also get out of the city and enjoy uh, for free. Mm. Walking up here, you, you were t talking about the the literary heritage of this area. And, you know, it's, I suppose, at a distance from the core of Kyoto that I, that I would think of as a suburb. And in, in America, suburbs do not necessarily bring with them a rich literary history. You know, what, 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 what do you find if you, if you scratch the, the, the surface and, and, and search, for, search for what this has inspired literarily? Well, what I find is that this wasn't a suburb. Uh, it was a sort of ox cart ride of about four or five hours. Mm. So this was the countryside. Uh, I came here in the 70s, and when I arrived, um, it was beginning to be suburbanified. You know, the, the rice fields were beginning to make way for housing estates. And now as we look down past the bamboo groves at the foot of Mount Ogre, you can see the city begins right there. It's only less than a kilometre from where we're sitting, uh, that was rice fields in the 70s. Mm. Uh, so it's gradually being filled in. In other words, the city has given planning permission to make extra housing in this area. However, if you look at the literary history of the area, this was separate from the city, and it was an area of uh, recluse living, hermitage living mm. for monks. It was also a, an, an area for villas, for those who could afford to get out here and use their villas as a place to write or to have parties for friends. In other words, in the Heian period particularly, the Kamakura period next, uh, it was a place for nobles to have their country retreats. Mm. It's, 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 it's a shock, I suppose, for somebody, for somebody like me coming from a distant place that, of, of course, you know, Japan, Japan boasts more, boasts a... boasts... A, more of a line of history than an unbroken line of history than a place like the United States of America. But you know, as we as we walked here talking about uh, the, the tale of Genji and things like that, it's it's uh, hard to believe almost for me that these the, these are the very places uh, the very places referenced in a book like that. You mean that what you're seeing with your eye and what you read in the books is such a different world. Uh, I guess. Uh, I'd like to contradict that, though, slightly, because mm. if I take you a minute through the woods and we look in the opposite direction from this vantage point we've climbed to, mm. you'll see that actually we really are on the edge of town and there are still rice fields, mm. and it hasn't changed so much. Uh, to the bamboo forest there from the station, the way that we came up the mountain, mm. yes, I agree with you, that is very heavily built up now. It's very hard to imagine the tale of Genji and ox carts and nobles coming out of the capital of Heian. Mm. Uh, if you go to some of the temples at the foot of Mount Ogre, you can reflect upon uh, hermitage living, mm. uh, priests who came out, priest Saigyo, who was a great insp inspiration for Matsuo Basho, the famous haiku poet. He lived here. Uh, there is a well where he drew his water. It takes a little bit of an act of imagination to imagine him in a little grass hut woven in the forest there. Mm. But the temples preserve something of the quietness. And uh, around the corner, as I say, there is still genuine countryside. So it's, uh, it's on the wane, but it's, I think, uh, with a bit of time, let's say. Mm. Colin, you need a half a day here just to tune in. Mm. It seems that every Kyoto resident I've spoken to on this program has had opinions about the way Kyoto has modernized, developed, built. When you think about the way that, since the 70s, since, since you first came here, the way that Kyoto has grown even since then, or modernized itself, you know, what, what, how, how do you regard that? Um, inevitable. Um, however, you know, if you're talking about aesthetics, uh, there's lots of 
piteous, lamentable things that have happened. For example, that tower there across in the centre of Kyoto, we have Kyoto Tower, a white uh, lighthouse-like object, uh, which has nothing to do. It has no relation with Kyoto architecturally. It's simply a symbol of a new ethos,、mm. which came perhaps in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Japan reinventing itself. Japan is a country, though, which is consistently、uh, within the space of simply a decade or two reinvented itself.、Mm. The whole country working as one unit. You know, it's very difficult to think of how Kyoto could have escaped from that. Actually, I I do think Kyoto is、uh, lucky.、Mm. It wasn't bombed in the war particularly. Uh, it's had some plagues and fires and earthquakes in the past, but largely the fabric of the old city is still there to be seen. And also, it's very cleverly preserved all these mountains on the outside. It has not defaced them with cable cars and uh, uh, roads and、uh, other buildings and things. So we always have this sort of arc around the city of genuine countryside, albeit problematical, unresolved issues. Uh, still to be faced there,、uh, environmental issues. But I do think that、uh, it is a place which is could have been much worse.、Uh, however, it's a place which still is in touch with its past, and again, it takes time to feel it. When I arrived in Kyoto, I was very disappointed the first time, just by the physical look of the place.、Mm. And I detect that in your question earlier. You know, walking up to this famous hill of poets on the edge of Kyoto, and yet it's sort of suburban in atmosphere.、Um, It is disappointing, but when you get to know the little beautiful places, the little oases in between all of the suburbia,、uh, you can piece together a world, a poetic world, a world in touch with a thousand years ago, and a world in touch with nature.、Uh, actually, it's a very sort of manageable place.、Mm. And you know, I don't, I don't personally. Mind is seeing the occasional building that re- that really sets off those who get angry about that that modernization, just because of the contrast it provides with with the historical buildings. For example, it, I don't know that the I don't know that the historical buildings or the the any type of historical site here would would pop out to me quite as distinctly if it, if there weren't a few bland tower blocks. Do you know what I mean? I know what you mean. Yes, and、uh, there's something about the. Glorious chaos of Asia. I wouldn't say this is particularly a Kyoto phenomenon.、Mm. Most Asian cities, I, I know many others, have this aspect. It's completely unplanned, chaotic. In fact, Kyoto, it should be pointed out, is more planned. It hasn't always been in the past, but at the moment, it's actually quite strict.、Mm. You're not allowed to build buildings over a certain height. You've probably heard this before.、Uh, they have to look in a certain way. There is strict planning laws now. But it's also got that chaotic Asian feel, where you have an old temple and a shack, and then you have a monstrous concrete building next door, and then one beautifully architect designed by somebody with great sense, and then you go back to another temple on the other side of the street. It's a mishmash.、Uh, it's kind of fun,、uh, but I wish that some of the larger buildings had been more carefully thought through.、Mm. Now, tell us about what sparked your interest. In Japan, was it was it poetry to begin with? Yes, it was.、Uh, I came to Japan the first time because I felt I was、uh, somehow related to Matsuo Basho, who is、mm. the great haiku genius. I had read his work in translation. I had been much affected by it. I was something of a traveller as a young man, travelling in Asia, for example. And when I got to Japan, I was already writing what I thought were haiku. So I really came, in a way, to see Basho's country.、Mm. My year, my first year in Kyoto in seventy four, seventy five, was spent largely visiting sites that Basho had had、uh, visited, and to try and tune into that haiku ethos.、Mm. Uh, haiku is very humble.、Uh, haiku is very spare.、Uh, haiku is full of、uh, implication,、uh, not trying to describe things, but、uh, just point towards. Greater realities, or humorous episodes, or、uh, sympathy with the past. There are lots of emotions in haiku, but they're latent. I love that sort of understatement and the、um, spareness of the expression. So I came to Japan as a poet and got influenced by the poetry, and now here I am living at the foot of the poet's mount.、Mm. How, how much? How much did you suspect, and how early on, that you could make Japan not? Simply a place to stop and gain inspiration, but to make it your home. First visit was 
age 20 or so, and I was essentially a student. I, in fact, I went back to finish uh, graduation at a, a British university. Uh, the second time I came, it was to work, uh, but I don't think I ever really felt I was going to be here for more than a year or two. You know, I was always slightly peripatetic, wanting to travel elsewhere. I had as much interest in places outside of Japan as in Japan itself. This third time, as I say, I came in 95, I really felt I'm going to make it my home. My wife was happy as well. Uh, we decided this was a great place to work out of. Uh, it's a very large population area. There's plenty of work going for people who deal with words. Mm. I do radio and translation and writing, and I can teach, of course, give lectures or talks. Uh, I think it's uh, a place that is difficult to adjust to. I remember having to go to the doctor uh, about once every month for the, my first two years. There was always something going wrong with my body. Mm. And I, I've never been like that. I've always been very healthy. I think there's something about adjusting to the floor life, to the humidity of summer, uh, to the cold dryness of winter. And I just didn't get, some, didn't get used to it quickly enough. It was a big adjustment, physical adjustment. I'm now used to it. I don't get ill now. Uh, culturally, I think I was quite in tune. This was my third visit, and it was not difficult to think of uh, making a career here. As I say, we intentionally chose this area because of its uh, the sort of pr prospect that we could have a bit of outreach from here. Another lovely thing about it is, as a foreigner, there's a constant stream of people coming here, so I don't feel cut off. Uh, my wife and I once thought perhaps we'll go and live in New Zealand. Uh, but I think if you lived in New Zealand, the number of people who would visit you is very, very diminished. You they, know? they are on a 20-hour <laughs> flight from certain places from Europe, for example. That's right. Oh. Whereas here, if anybody's going to come to Japan, and if they have just a day or two spare, you know, even if their business is in Tokyo, for example, they're going to get on that bullet train and come through Kyoto and stay here for a day or two. I do feel, you know, I, I'm constantly... Um, given pleasure by people visiting, which is a lovely aspect of living in Kyoto. And you're also introducing so much of Japan remotely. I mean, you, you make radio programs for the BBC. Tell me about offering these aspects of Japan, whether it's, whether it's Poets Mount or, the, or Singing Insects or what have you, offering, offering things Japanese to a BBC audience. You know, what does it, what does it take to do that correctly, to do it, to, to convey to convey what you love about these things? The... Konnichiwa. Konnichiwa. The, um, the main thing is to feel inspired, you know. It's no good just being given a brief and working through it. I, I always approach the BBC with an inspiration. Like, I had an inspiration in my mind for whales underwater on the distant seacoast of Japan mm. and certain poems by Busan about the sun rising over rape blossom fields in the mm. early spring. It's, if you like, it's a sort of uh, image. And then I make the program to go with the image and hopefully mm. it's poetic and beautiful. Mm. In that particular program, I put in a lot of writing by Lafcadio O'Hearn, who mm. I very much admire. Another example, the insect program. I found some recordings by NHK of insects uh, strictly for identification purposes. Mm. And those insects were all so beautiful. The names by which they were known, the different songs, the, the references in the haiku world uh, to the changes of the seasons, as perceived by poets over the ages, uh, listening to the insects singing. What a magical thing it is. Mm. So I made that program about insects. It always comes from some inspiration. The, my most recent inspiration was unfortunately a very sad one, and of course it was the tsunami. Mm. And I looked at uh, the terrible pictures that I had seen, like everybody saw, of the tsunami damage and this radio radiation falling over the eastern part of Japan. And I took my time. I didn't want to go in immediately. Uh, I think somebody approached me and said, why don't you go straight up there in a journalistic way? It's not my scene at all. Mm. I wanted to think slowly and go slowly and let people digest and then interview and write poetry and interface with poets of mm. the place, not get sort of gut reactions immediately. So I went up nearly a year after the event where there was still lots of chaos and still lots of misery and suffering and I followed Basho's path up into that area of Japan as recorded in The Narrow Road to the Deep North, a mm. classic of haiku literature. So I dovetailed uh, Basho's poems with 
poems written during the disaster, actually during the first few weeks of the disaster. For example, a poet who writes uh, Twitter uh, poems, uh, very short poems, but he has a great following here in Japan, and uh, he wrote about the radiation falling on Fukushima uh, on the day that the radiation explosions happened, and uh, he's been publishing his poems on the internet for a long time. So I had a lot of vivid contemporary poetic pieces, also some written by myself, up there, contrasted with the classical trip of Basho. So that was a sort of inspiration built out of an idea to see how things had changed and what sort of poetry was now being written in this terrible new situation confronting that part of Japan. Earlier we referenced the sense, and this was expressed by indeed one of the one of the volunteers whose whose poetry appears in the collection, the sense that a foreigner a foreigner was the one to show some Japanese their own mountain. To your mind, are there are there certain things better, certain things Japanese better shown to the Japanese by a foreigner uh, than themselves, or or yeah, even out of this context? I mean, are you are you of the mind that it does take outsiders oftentimes to uh, to cast the, the necessary light? It's a very good question, Colin. I've often felt that I really only learnt about Britain when I had lived abroad and came back to it. So I think there is something to be said for the outsider's perspective. It may have uh, a, a greater sort of comparative quality, mm. what is normal elsewhere. So that is quite enlightening for the Japanese because they're always anxious to compare themselves to what happens outside. So that reference point is valuable. The other thing is I think there's a great deal of shame. When a foreigner says it, it's shameful. Mm. When another Japanese says it, there are going to be excuses and mm. systematic errors and things will be explained in that way. Mm. When a foreigner says it's much more emotional. Mm. So I think being a foreign poet in this area is like a sort of thorn in the side of authority. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but not, not, a, not a threatening thorn, a, a thorn, but perhaps a, a thorn, a thorn that's, there's almost a, the, the, the population seems almost to welcome it, a, a necessary thorn they, they accept. Yes, I think probably um, the vast majority of people would accept that that's a very healthy prick. Mm. Uh, however, I do always think back to the poor old guy who was in charge of the Machi Bika department when the program was broadcast, I mentioned earlier. And he was also interviewed, and he gave a rather poor interview, making lots of excuses for why nobody had ever collected this rubbish and uh, said, you know, there were no funds and nobody had really realised there was so much of it and all sorts of other reasons. And he was actually fired after the broadcast of the programme the following Monday, I think. So, you know, some people may think of myself and, and the group around uh, who, act, who act on behalf of the mountain as uh, really painful thorns. Um, we, we spent a long time battering at the doors of the city office, the city hall, uh, trying to get some sort of attention. And it really was, to be honest, it was when the media started to take an interest that the city office actually started to act. Mm. There's, there's a sense in which, a, a sense in which you, you have to, you have to, uh, maybe it's true everywhere, but I was going to say in, in Japan, there, there has to be, the, 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 the fuss certainly has to precede the action. Yeah. Mm. I mean, the action can go on quietly in a meaningful way. But if you want it to snowball and really take uh, a, a big effect, if you want to have a pronounced effect, and this is a big mountain mm. and it's a big issue and it's got m many aspects to it, it's not just rubbish, you know, you, you want to make a bit of a splash, uh, we're into a rather comfortable mode at the moment and it slightly worries me, actually. I think that in a way you do need some uh, publicity and things going wrong and, and minds suddenly through an emergency mm. being focused. If you get comfortable and a certain number of volunteers come on a certain day of the week and everything's all nice and cosy, it begins to sort of fossilize, you know. Mm. I'm very anxious that we're not like that. This is a tendency, especially perhaps in Kyoto. When systems are made here in Kyoto, they tend to last not 10 years. No, 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 no. They last 100 years or possibly mm. even 500 years. And I see, as I look out over the city there, not only the sort of structural fabric of Kyoto, but I also see systems, you know, systems of uh, cottage industry systems and systems of uh, interaction between certain 
parts of Kyoto, like, you know, the part over there by the Kamo River, is a lot of wealthy people, and they have their own social world, and they're attached to one particular university. And there are all sorts of systems here, whether they be social or industrial or political, and religious. We have all the different religions here. Many, many have important temples are uh, centered here, and important religious sects. There are a lot of very entrenched systems, and it's very easy to get entrenched, mm. get your roots down too deeply here. It's a rather sort of uh, clammy, boggy, sticky sort of place. <laughs> is, is there, to your mind, can, can the comfort of the complacency be actively disrupted does it need to be is that is that healthy can it be done you know especially as regards the comfort that may that the preservation efforts of, of mount ogre may, may settle into is can you strike at that complacency or is it something you simply must hope is disrupted very very difficult to do it in mm. kyoto it's extremely difficult i know because i have um, people who are older than me who've done this sort of thing for longer than me and I hear their experience, you know, and uh, it's a difficult place to get things done, mm. uh, new things, new ideas. But it does need to be shaken up, certainly does. Mm. Uh, I think if Kyoto could be thoroughly shaken up, I don't want an earthquake, good, right. God forbid, but I mean metaphorically shaken up so that it really had to reinvent itself, it would probably be a good idea because in its reinvention it's obviously going to take stock of all the traditional things which it's good at. It's not going to throw those out of the window. But it needs to sort of... Uh, it really needs to shake itself up because the world's changing so fast. I think that there is a danger of sort of fossilization. It's a perennial danger in Kyoto. Well, what could shake up Kyoto that doesn't cause damage and death and, and whatnot? <sighs> it's very difficult to say. You know, I mean, if it, if it were politics, I'd I'd really welcome it. If there was some way that the political world could be shaken up from somewhere like Kyoto, it would be wonderful. Although, interestingly, the political world here has been dominated by communists until very recently. Kyoto has always had a communist mayor. Communist. Communism, yeah. Which in Japan uh, means the same thing as we would consider communism to mean? It's a sort of mild form of cooperation-type communism, but it's called the Communist Party, and it has always had very strong roots in Kyoto. I remember in the 70s this was very much a communist stronghold. But in those days there were students, you know, who were very left-wing, mm. uh, barricading the entrance to oh, the yes. campuses and stuff. I mean, I actually saw that. Mm. Uh, I was a student, but I wasn't actually attached to any university here. But, uh, yeah, there's a communist streak in Kyoto. But whether there's anything that could come from Kyoto that would shake up Kyoto, I rather doubt. I think it's going to be shaken up by forces from outside. Mm. What those forces are, I really don't know. Uh, but it won't be just Kyoto, you know. But Kyoto needs a shake-up. As, as an old city, it needs to reinvent itself. I mean, at one, one point, you know, Kyoto is too introverted. It looks in on itself. It's too much of a bubble, you know. Now, that works in its favour if you want to preserve the old things, just as they always have been. But it's never going to get anywhere and promote itself in a new world uh, if it just falls back on its old... Uh, identity, you know, mm. and uh, however many committees are formed to look towards the future for Kyoto, how it can play a role in the future Japan, I, I can't imagine that it's going to come from Kyoto itself at the moment. That's a rather pessimistic view, perhaps, but I think it's going to be dictated to from the outside. Mm. Now, before we close by hearing some of your own poetry, I wanted to ask, there's, there's a phrase you've used in regard to a, a, a number of things, one of which is a uh, the idea of a Japanese person being able to tune in to to the the spirit of of Mount Ogura, uh, you being able to come come to Japan and, and tune in on the on the sensibility of a Matsuo Basho, how long I would have to spend here before I could tune in to 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 what's going on right here. What what to your mind does it does it mean to to have tuned in? Well, it means a sense of home, you know. I mean, as you, you asked before, did I come out to live here or what point did I feel I could make a home here? And that was a conscious thing in 95. Mm. Uh, I had a spiritual home in the haiku world in Japan, even before I came to put down solid roots, you know. I felt in a way spiritually this was a home. Can you repeat the end part of the question? I think I've got slightly lost. Is yeah. what, it, what it means to your mind to, to, to have tuned in whether it is to this mountain or this city or... It's or a sort of vague question. That's why I couldn't remember what it was. It's a bit too vague, but yeah. I just was curious <laughs> about getting a little more detail on what you, you specifically think okay, of when well, you think of tuning in. in. Is, is to 
to relate to the nightfall mm. in the mountain forest. You know, tuning in is to stop and talk to the farmer in his field. Mm. Tuning in is to hear the first lark in the spring and write a poem about it. Uh, these are things that are tuning in to me. I mean, it's partly to be in tune with nature. It's partly to be in tune with your locality. Uh, it's also to relate to the students you're teaching or to the poets you're working with and, mm. you know, in daily life. I mean, that's all tuning in. Um, I think also it's tuning into the past because this is the old capital and, uh, you know, I'm aware of that ancient stratum of uh, poetry particularly and history. Mm. And it is here, it's latent, you know. It's in people's minds, they carry it around in these temples, the monks walking around, you know. Mm. They can quote their founder's thoughts, you know, 1,000 years ago, and they still live true to the, his ideas, you know. There's something about being in touch with the past and the present and with the, changings of the changing seasons and the changing food on the table and the people around you, of course. You need Japanese language, ultimately. Mm. Yeah. And now, if we could close with, with poetry of your own, I, I, I don't know if I can even decide based on, based on what you showed me before we started recording, but it's whichever ones you would like to read, as, as many as you would like to, uh, I, I think listeners will at this point be dying to hear them. I've been keeping, I've been keeping them from them. But now, as we close, which would you like to read? Well, Colin, I only brought a few... Uh, about Mount Ogre because that's where we decided to do the interview so uh, a beautiful one to start with uh, this is one that's on a stone in Vancouver in a park because it just happened to be chosen uh, to commemorate cherry blossom and it was written that's a deer crying by the way that high pitched voice so this is a spring poem in clearing mist the creaking of a heavy oar cherry blossoms well that was written looking down into the misty gorge with a few little glimpses of cherry blossom through the rising mist and down on the gorge there are boats plying the waters creaking of the oars coming through the mist Ogre is a very seductive place it's so bewitching and a sad one from the northern flank of Ogre a summer poem heat of the day, a pine-clad cliff down which a washing machine has tumbled. And to go into our book, we've published a few of my poems in this book. Uh, these are probably from the day when I wrote a hundred poems, so I just read you a little sequence. I started off very early in the morning. I marked the time. This is 4.22 as I set off for Mount Ogre. Acknowledging first light, the owl of Mount Ogre, its own chill tone. 5.25. Zigzag of a forest moth. Slowly, sun. Slowly. Six o'clock. Different parts of the city gleaming, glistening through branches of dead pine. 8.20 in the morning. The backside of Ogre. A tangle of mountain vines. The ailing spring of Ogre. Collecting speed. About midday, just after, a flotilla of boats plies the summer ravine, their wet oars flash like diamonds. One thirty in the afternoon, black butterfly leads me along an impassable track, then dives away. 142. There is a deeper trail cut between sandbanks by millions of feet. The forest knows. 3.28 in the afternoon. At the foot of a thicket, 
a petrified sack of cement, its sacking rotted, has joined other stones. 401. Green light in the laurel wood, its white moon amanita. 505. Coming down the mountain again after a long hike. Across a great, wide, brooding, wooded hillside, summer rain falls. And 542, number 95 of the hundred. Emerald River, by a toe-sized tadpole, bathing my aching feet. I've been sitting here on Mount Agora speaking with Stephen Gill, poet, teacher, translator, creator of radio programs, and Mount Ogura preservationist. Stephen, thank you so much. Thank you, Colin. It was a pleasure. Thanks for coming to Mount Ogura. This has been Notebook on Cities and Culture. I've been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the show at colinmarshall.org. Thanks. And special thanks to everybody who backed Season 3 on Kickstarter, including Paige Calvert, Jonathan Crow, Douglas Dollars, Paul Doyle, John French, Eric Graham, Will Graham, Umberto Grant, Kimberly Hahn, Carl Haley, Stefan Halperin, Matt Howie, Andrew Hovenick, Mark Hines, Andy Cooney, Mark Larson, Matthew Licky, Mr. Munvirzi, Rob Motz, Lindsay Muniak, Daniel Murphy, Aidan Nolman, Patrick O'Flaherty, Danny Olson, Michael O'Regan, Blake Riley, Rob Schultz, Cam Smith, Small Demons, Todd Shimoda, Kevin Smokler, Thomas Unterberger, Matt Warren, and Wayne Wright.